Oh yeah, I see it recorded. Okay. Yep, got it. Welcome everyone uh, to our next installment of the Lake Friendly Living series. Um, I'm really excited today about our guest. He is a true gift to the Seneca Lake watershed um, and just a really great mind on uh, all things uh, related to Seneca Lake watershed. Um, he's our Seneca watershed steward. Um, he, he, he runs out of uh, a, a Geneva office, but he operates all across the watershed. And I'm really excited to welcome Ian Smith today uh, to talk to us about stormwater reduction systems. Um, and this is, uh, you know, gonna be a presentation format, but feel free to uh, put questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring that and uh, we'll have a question uh, period at the end. So um, Ian, uh, please feel free to take it away. Thanks for that overly generous introduction, Jacob. Uh, yeah. So. They give me a ton of a uh, ton of guidance on this, so I'm I'm just going to go off the cuff a little bit here. Um, as Jacob said, I'm going to talk a little bit about stormwater reduction systems, um, and there's a lot of things you can do from from practices to to like constructed systems. So we're just going to focus on on one aspect of that. But before we get specifically into that, um, let me get the slide to advance here. There we go. We'll uh, we'll go back to the very beginning, and this is something that I don't think a, a ton of people, as I've as I've talked around the watershed, spend a whole lot of time specifically thinking about is is what do we really mean when we talk about pollution? Um, and there's there's two sides to pollution. So on one, what we're really talking about is there's too much of something and it's in the wrong place. And I say that because, for example, you know, in in your garden, you may want a certain high amount of nutrients to, to feed your vegetable production. But as soon as that, that those nutrients and food find their way into a stream or the lake, suddenly it's no longer beneficial in that setting. So when you really you really need to think of those two things in, in unison. So on one side is the supply. Um, that can be things like nutrients, metals, salts, oil, pathogens, plastics, all sorts of stuff. Um, but on the other half, it's also the transport of that thing from where it's being generated and where it's wanted, where it's not wanted. And of course, the transport mechanisms can vary a lot. Um, air, you know, a, a smokestack, a car, water, which is what we're going to talk about specifically tonight. And then obviously just physical transport with uh, trash, things like that. So if we go back to sixth grade or so, we all, we all, got introduced to the water cycle, of course, and we know water's not really created, it just moves around the system all over the place. So you get this continuous cycle of water moving from one environment to the other. And when you have rainfall and precipitation on the landscape, there's really four primary pathways on where that rainfall can get end up. It can, um, it can infiltrate into the ground, it can evaporate back into the atmosphere, usually through water pooling on the surface, or it can transpire back in the atmosphere through uptake by vegetation and then respiration, or it can go and form surface runoff. Um, and that's specifically what we're, what we're talking about with, with stormwater runoff. It's that surface runoff over the landscape into the surface waters that we're, that we're interested in. And as we have altered our system, our, uh, our topography over time into different land uses, we've altered that balance between those, those pathways. So all these, all our streams formed a relatively stable based on the environment they were formed in over, you know, that receded. And then as we've come in, we've altered the landscape and the properties of that land. And in turn, we've to the hydrology of that landscape. So here you can see the city and town of Geneva, of, uh, Geneva. And what would have been largely wetlands and deciduous forest, we've now converted in, in this mix of, you know, high density urban, hard surfaces, impervious surface, uh, farm fields, uh, a little, we've, we've moved a lot of wetlands away to convert it into farms. So we, we've altered the landscape to suit various needs, obviously to, to habitate it, but, and, as an unintended consequence, we've altered the hydrology in a negative uh, means. And our traditional um, approach to water management doesn't really benefit the natural systems around that are receiving this water either. So, you know, this, this general get off my lawn approach where, where we've designed our traditional stormwater management structures to really get 
the water off of the landscape as quickly and as soon as possible. Um, so in some cases, that's by necessity. So in the, in the central upper picture here, you know, tile drainage, it, it makes it far more productive or, or Castle Creek and just below it, um, you know, we, we channelize the stream channel so that the, that the road is, is there in place and stable or right in front of the Geneva Town Hall, we've got stormwater um, and let's get water off the road so it's safe to travel. So there, there are reasons we do this, but it creates unintended consequences for, for um, receiving waters that are downstream of this because when we, when we limit the amount of uh, retention time of the landscape to hold water and we just shove it all downstream, it means that all that force is being distributed and, and cumulative to wherever it's being received downstream. So the further you go and you receive, uh, you're receiving these effects, the, the more the damage is going to be. And of course, to make matters even worse, we know that some of the future trends that we expect to see are going to make this even more challenging to manage over time. Um, so on one hand, we're seeing uh, a mean annual increase in the total precipitation that we see year over year. Obviously, this year didn't follow that pattern, but in general, since uh, I think this goes back to 1931, we, we've increased by about 15%. This is the uh, Geneva, Exper Geneva Experimental Station record um, just up on, uh, what is that, on the Cornell Cooperative Extension. Um, and of course, on the other side, our models also project the really high intense uh, events where we get more than one inch of rain in an hour or less. Those are more likely to be frequent going forward. Um, we've already seen a 71 excuse me, percent increase um, since the 50s, and that trend's projected to continue. Um, so put those two things together, plus our, um, our, our existing management structure just shove water off land and into the into a receiving body and we've really altered that balance there um, where we've reduced our infiltration evaporation and transpiration but we've increased our proportion that's going to runoff and the consequences are are obvious so it's the video of uh, uh glenora falls a big stream um i don't know maybe 15 miles south of us on the western side of the lake um, this was just one inch of rain and I mean, that, that shouldn't happen, <laughs> frankly, um, but that, that's what we've done to the landscape. And of course, the, the consequences of all this are, are pretty well documented at this point. Um, you've got erosion, both soil loss and streaming destabilization, flood and obviously um, that creates infrastructure issues. I know on uh, Turk Road, the, the culvert there is, is washed out, sounds like every two or three years. Um, and of course, the, that increase in flood and risk also results in, in costs, whether we don't see them directly, but all of our insurance rates go up. And if you've ever lived near or in a floodplain, you've, you've seen that trend over 20 years, um, unfortunately. And of course, this also creates resource limitations, um, the reductions in the quality and the availability of water, such as in groundwater. Um, that limits uses such as irrigation or in the case of Seneca Lake, obviously um, a lot of sediment running off into the lake can create issues for our drinking water operations, both the city and uh, city of Geneva water supply and across on the other side, the village of Waterloo, they've had to shut down or reduce operations sometimes just due to the heavy sediment load entering the lake near their intakes. And then obviously ecological degradation of, of the streams themselves. So this is where we're at now. So we need to start thinking about how do we shift it back? And that's really what we're going to talk about tonight. So obviously to do that, we need to increase infiltration, transpiration, evaporation. And so specifically what we're doing to promote these activities, um, we want to get more water into the soil to increase infiltration. We want to get more water intercepted by vegetation so that it gets uptake to allow for transpiration back to the atmosphere. Or we want to hold water somewhere at the surface rather than let it torrentially run off into a stream and just hold it in a pond so they can evaporate back in the atmosphere. And there's a there's a common saying in the storm monitoring management, slow it, spread it, sink it. And that's really the, the core strategy to how you deal with, with storm water. Now, um, there are behavioral practices that, that we can do to um to do to, to manage storm water, such as just you know, not cutting your lawn is 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 short. Um, but I don't really want to talk about a lot of that stuff. I think I think that stuff's pretty well documented in in 
it's definitely out there and a lot of the lake associations have put out lake friendly living guides and i know the town is is embarked on on that as well um so i really want to talk more about engineered solutions surprise surprise given my engineering background that's what i'm more interested in some most of the time um and they one of the things that's really gotten hold in the stormwater engineering side of things is green infrastructure um and it's it's become a bit of a a catch-all really um, so to give you a little bit of introduction to it, I'm going to show you a, a video that we created in the summer for a program, um, just to give you a, a quick run through at some of the things that's going to entail before we dive in a little deeper. Hello, this is Ian Smith from Swio again. I think I will. If I can get video, it started. We'll be looking at green infrastructure I hear it. For those new to the term, can you hear green it? infrastructure, or GI I can, for short, I can hear it, is and an now I see water management these, that protects. Uh, restores Website. or mimics the okay. natural water cycle. When properly implemented, GI is an effective and economic alternative to traditional stormwater management systems. Stormwater runoff, the product of rainstorms or snowmelt, flows over ground and into drains, sewers, or waterways. Pollutants are collected and transported along this journey, while excessive levels of runoff can result in flooding and damage to infrastructure and property downstream. GI systems help to reduce the volume of runoff and, in some cases, actively remove pollutants as well. As a general rule, the more permeable a surface, the less runoff there will be. Natural landscapes, such as meadows and forests, can readily absorb much of the rain or snowmelt that they receive. GI systems mimic the biological and or physical characteristics of such landscapes to reduce and treat runoff. Vegetation is a common feature of many GI systems. One of the simplest examples of GI is tree plantings. Trees are extremely efficient water consumers, and a 100-foot tree can pull more than 10,000 gallons of water from the soil in a single growing season. In doing so, they also store pollutants within their biomass and improve the permeability of the soil. While stream restoration is a topic worth its own discussion, Plants and trees within deteriorated floodplains, such as that shown here along Castle Creek in Geneva, can be particularly effective given the additional benefits they provide to the stream itself. In some cases, trees aren't appropriate vegetation though, such as when near a building. Rain gardens, such as this one located at the Schuyler County Soil and Water District Office, are purpose-built plantings designed to divert and treat roof runoff. They do this by maximizing the permeability within the soil and using plants that are particularly well adapted to thrive in periodically saturated soils. A similar approach is used in another GI system called a tree trench. Tree trenches are typically placed adjacent to urban roadways, parking lots, and sidewalks to intercept runoff before it runs into a stormwater inlet box. Runoff is diverted from the impervious surface into the tree trench where it is held allowing for both percolation through the soil and uptake by trees and other vegetation. Multiple tree trenches can be linked together, such as these in the neighboring Canandaigua Lake watershed, to treat a greater volume of runoff. While there are no such systems currently in the Seneca Cuca watershed to my knowledge, very similar designs are part of the work scheduled to be done in the city of Geneva. Another example of GI that can be found here in the Seneca Cuca watershed is a bioswale. Like tree trenches, these systems are often placed adjacent to roadways and parking lots, such as the one here in Watkins Glen. In this instance, the slope of the parking lot directs runoff into the bioswale located in the center. Permeable soils and vegetation types similar to those used in rain gardens are used here to capture, hold, and treat the runoff, while underdrain piping has been installed to increase the percolation rate. Percolated water is diverted into the underdrain which collects and discharges treated water into a vegetated retention basin where it can recharge groundwater or be discharged to Glen Creek. Retention basins are yet another example of GI and come in many different sizes and configurations. These basins here, located in the Kashan Conservation Area, collect and hold diffuse runoff from the surrounding landscape. Unlike traditional stormwater basins, these are unlined and allow water to percolate. Furthermore, these basins have a controlled outlet that allows the water level to fluctuate and increases the retention capacity of the basin. One final type of GI we'll look at, and perhaps the most well-known, is a rain barrel. 
These rather simple devices consist of little more than the barrel to hold water, a faucet valve to release it, and a screen inlet to divert water into the barrel. Rain barrels are placed at the end of a downspout to collect roof runoff. The property owner can then simply release the water at a slow enough rate to allow for percolation and groundwater recharge, or use it to water gardens, houseplants, and other non-perishable vegetation. These are just some of the many examples of GI out there. I hope this video has inspired you to explore the subject further and maybe even implement some GI yourself. All right, so I'm gonna have to trust that you're telling me the truth, Jacob, and you could hear that because I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> really? I mean, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, I heard anyway, I just I think I just was I just wanted to show that video because I'm just I just wanted to convey that the thing to that, that's really really fascinating and and great about GI is that it's so malleable. Um, it's it's really scalable. It can be you can it can include you know a, a rain barrel at the end of a downspout or it can be an entire stream restoration project um it can be you know some hardened system or it can be plants in a tree um it's a really it's really about an approach to mimic in natural systems so within that within that umbrella is a lot of options and that's it, it's why it's really taken on a lot of interest in uh in urban and planning and i think I think it's largely been confined to urban, um, but I think it has applications for us here as well. Um, it's going to take that because I want to say about 94% of our watershed is is private property. So it's going to take individuals um, executing small scale projects on mass rather than, you know, one large scale project to really get at the stormwater reduction that we're looking for. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to dig down a little bit and look specifically at some of these systems as they're applied to residential areas under the assumption that's just the people that are joining us tonight. Um, so in the residential setting, what, what are the issues that we're trying to deal with to counter stormwater runoff? So you've got runoff from the roof, um, uh, lawn runoff. Lawns, depending on the amount of vegetation you have in them, don't have much capacity to absorb water, especially here with all of our clay soils. Um, gutters, depending on where they go, how they're connected, can make a big difference. Uh, of course, the driveway itself also. Um, and then streets. We'll, we'll stay away from streets because that's usually more of a municipality thing. But we'll look at what at some systems that, residential, that residents can uh, implement on their own properties. So as I stated in that video, the, the most well known is probably the rain barrel. Um, and it's really, really good at that slow it in terms of that slow it side of, of this, this equation. Um, it just collects water runoff from your roof. You connect it to your, your downspout. And it just provides a temporary storage for that water. Um, and the nice thing is it gives you an additional resource for water to use. Um, my neighbors. Uh, rain barrels here, they use to, to water all their plants in their garden, which is okay, although I wouldn't recommend it for things you wanna eat, um, who knows what's in your roof. But uh, otherwise, a really great idea, especially this year <laughs> with the drought. Um, another one and very similar is a, is a dry well. Um, this is sort of the same idea, but what you're doing here is you're essentially taking that rain barrel um, and not so much storing it in perpetuity until you release it, but rather you're creating a larger void space where that water can accumulate um, and then slowly infiltrate it in the ground because these get buried into the soil and you surround it with a lot of aggregate to increase a lot of the, the um, porosity within the soil and give more space for the water to absorb. Um, so that, that increases the infiltration rate for your soil around your home. So very, very popular in uh, Texas, for some reason I discovered. Um, another one that, that you can apply to the end of your downspout that, that we saw in the video, uh, a rain garden. These, these are super popular. Um, they, they have a few limitations here. Um, we, we like our, our basements around here. Um, so oftentimes people will take their rain garden and put it away from their house. Um, but essentially what you're doing 
is you're purposely creating an amended soil structure to again um, introduce a lot of pore space between the soil aggregates so that there's a lot of volume for that water to go into. And in this situation, you're also integrating that sort of physical structure of the soil with vegetation and you're planting um, plants that are really resistant to fluctuations in water and can absorb a lot of that water and then transpire back to the atmosphere. So you're getting a bit of everything with rain garden systems. And with these, the only, the only consideration you really need to think about is um, you really need to be careful in terms of the calculation of, of the water that they're going to receive. So you need to know how much um, runoff is coming off of the, the downspout that the roof is feed into to know how much water they can hold so that they don't wash out prematurely from a uh, excessive rainfall. So you need to size them properly. But the nice thing about them is they require very little management too. You just, once they're planted, properly sized, sort of for, set it and forget it. Um, and where you don't have the sort of landscape space, um, folks in the town of Geneva probably don't have to worry about that, but here in the city, um, a lot of our, our residents don't have a whole lot of open space to put in a rain garden. So we can, um, we can create a sort of uh, artificial rain garden inside of a box. And these, car, these are called downspout planter boxes. Um, very similar concept though. You're, you're creating a uh, artificial soil structure that allows for the capture and storage of water on a temporary basis and then combining that with vegetation. And then and the thing with these planter boxes, you also need to create a, uh, an overflow structure so that once they fill up, um, there's a there's a place for the water to go and, and not flood. But the, the nice thing about about both the uh, rain garden and, and the planter box, even if they do get overwhelmed, it's really that first flush that contains a lot of the pollutants associated with storm water. And while we're talking about, you know, limited in transport, um, the nice thing is when you, when you intercept that water, you really capture in the majority of those pollutants associated with it in that initial first flush. So even if you're not capturing all of the water runoff, you're at least slowing it down initially and you're capturing the majority of the nutrients initially, or like the uh, pollutants initially as well. Um, so this can be applied to both a roof and a driveway in a similar situation where you don't have a lot of yards to direct your roof gutter into. Um, porous asphalt or permeable pavement um, on the left is the asphalt. This is becoming increasingly um, common and, and certainly a nice thing to see. It, it, very similar to the amended soil structure in the planter box, um, you're artificially creating um, void space in this case, inside asphalt instead of inside a soil. So you're given a place for the water to go through, percolate through very quickly and get in, in and infiltrate it into the ground and recharging groundwater instead of running off and over the surface into streams. Um, and perio pavers are, are very similar. Um, you're just creating that void space in between the, the pavers themselves rather than in the structure of the pavers. Um, the really nice thing about these is they're actually better um, than gravel itself. So if you've ever have lived in a house with a gravel driveway, you'll, you'll notice that over time as you drive over, you're compacting the soil and you, you reduce a lot of, a lot of the inherent um, permeability of gravel by getting small particles of actually clog by that pore, those pore spaces. These, these pavers and this asphalt, as long as you maintain them, and they're pretty easy to maintain, you just really need to pressure wash them every few years or blow them with a leaf blower around, right, uh, once a year or twice a year. Um, and that really helps eliminate that issue with, with the gravel roadway. And so these are actually will maintain their permeability for much longer than uh, the comparable um, systems, even natural systems like gravel or, or dirt that can compact. Um, and if you do have asphalt and you don't want to convert it, obviously, especially in, in the town there, I know some of those driveways out there can get pretty long. What you can do is instead the water that's running off the driveway and the roof and potentially your yard as well, wherever it's, it's going, you can try to artificially capture and amend um, that surface runoff. So bioswales are a super, super good um, engineering solution to deal with the runoff of all sorts of uh, surfaces. So very similar to a rain garden with a bit more engineering. So bioswales um, are a little more purposefully designed 
to specifically handle um, changes in much larger ranges of uh, water runoff. So they incorporate things like a perforated underdrain or check dams or uh, similar such structures so that they can handle a larger range of, uh, of water conditions and, and saturated conditions. So just uh, another level of engineering involved, but extremely effective um, both in terms of longevity and uh, performance in terms of, of capture and storm water runoff and releasing it very slowly or, or uptake by plants um, and retranspiration of the atmosphere. And then very similar to that um, is, a, is a retention basin or a wetland. And really the only difference is how much vegetation do you have there? Um, so retention basins are basically just much more three-dimensional versions of a bioswale. So you have a lot more vertical storage for water that can handle a lot more um, surface runoff volume in a, in a square footage area. Um, and then of course, as you incorporate vegetation, wetland vegetation, you also incorporate some ecological benefits. Um, and again, you get more transpiration and evaporation back into the, the atmosphere because you're storing water at the surface and giving it time to, uh, to cycle back through without running off into a nearby surface water. And I think Jacob might wanna to touch on this, but these, these pictures are from the uh, Kashan Conservation Area Project that the town of Geneva um, implemented last year. And of course, those are just some of the ones that you can you can institute at home. But again, GI is extremely flexible, and by, there are hundreds of examples of uh, GI that can be implemented. They can range from really expensive things like a uh, a green roof uh, there in the image in the upper left. Um, depending on the setting, they, you, the the system can be adapted. So in the lower left is a grass waterway that you'll find on um, agricultural areas in the town. Um, similarly. You can a mix of um, aggregate and vegetation in a drainage ditch, or you can scale these things way up and uh, do a complete restoration of an altered, of an altered landscape, such as the uh, the Honey Oint restoration inlet restoration project completed last year. Really a remarkable project that uh, I'm hoping we can someday emulate here. Um, yeah, I mean GI is extremely adaptable and it's becoming increasingly popular um, because. While it's a little more complicated and sometimes more expensive up front than traditional um, engineered storm water solutions, they just have much longer lifespans and they're more robust and they're more they're more flexible. So long term, they're just a, an easier, so more stable solution to, to storm water management. Um, and as I've talked about, this is as I've talked about this subject in, in various settings. You know, we've talked a lot about what you can do. Um, but a lot of people keep asking, that's great, but how do I do these things? Um, and that's really something that I think is a focus. Um, I know it's a focus that I want to I wanna look into more. Um, Ontario Soil and Water has been putting on rain barrel workshops for a couple of years now. And obviously with COVID, um, they took it virtual this year. And I thought, you know, that is an excellent idea. So Soil and Water, um, SWIO, a um, couple other partners, we're looking at funding sources to create a virtual library where people can reference and take on um, some of these projects themselves. Because at the end of the day, it, that's really what it's going to take. It's going to take people opting in to implement these practices themselves um, on their land. And frankly, a lot of these things are, are fairly easy to do. Um, I, I put a drywall on my house this year and it cost me less than 100 bucks. Um, and I don't have any flooding on my driveway anymore. So I, I think I think people are are interested. They just need to have a better understanding of how they can do it themselves. It can be a little intimidating sometimes. Um, but with that, I'll just mention because I feel obligated to <laughs> since I was brought here for it. Um, all of this is is loosely tied to the um, Sunakiki Kawasha Nine Amount Plan. Um, Hopefully most of you are aware of it. It's a, a watershed management plan that will that we are currently working on um, that will help us identify projects of interest to the community and identify project needs for the community and get those things in the plan so that it will access um, dollars that we can all um, use to implement some of the projects that we talked about tonight. So 
please participate um, in, in the NIAMA plan if, if all possible as a community endeavor. And thanks for the time. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Jacob. Thanks so much, Ian. Really great presentation. Uh, you know, loved how, how, how simple you talk about things. You know, you, you mentioned you're an engineer background. I can tell, and you know, you hear a lot of these topics being talked about throughout different industries, whether they be, um, you know, traditional agriculture, permaculture, uh, you know, really, you know, heavily uh, traditionally engineered things. And now, you know, uh, it's really fascinating to me how much uh, green infrastructure has, has taken off in the past few years. Um, and, and I, I kind of wanted to, uh, you know, start off a little bit of the comment period by asking you about that and feel free, I'm gonna ask a few questions. Uh, and if anyone else, uh, out there has, has questions, feel free to put it in the chat or uh, press raise your hand and uh, we can take that question. But, but Ian, I, you know, you, you mentioned it a little bit, you know, green infrastructures, um, everyone's talking about it now. Um, what, what were we talking about before this? And, you know, maybe, maybe wh uh, why, why did we not think it was a big deal previously? So as you can imagine, builders, contractors, engineers, you know, they traditionally have liked very structured hardscape systems. So if you think about stormwater management on a parking lot, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of one in town. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head in town. But oftentimes, if you, if you go to like a large box store or a mall, for example, you'll see, you know, storm grates and throughout the parking lot, it's just a sea of asphalt with storm grates intermittently spurst. And all those storm grates go into a big concrete box somewhere. Now, sometimes that box may have some vertical capacity to absorb the water, but traditionally that box simply connected it to a municipal stormwater system. And again, it gets back into that traditional approach. Get that water away from me as quickly as possible to reduce the likelihood of flooding and water issues on my property. And that's great for your property if that's where the water is that you're concerned with. But if you're downstream, now you've got a whole different problem because not only do you have your water on your property downstream, but you got all that water that's been shoved upstream coming down towards you way faster than it should. So you can think about that. You've got, you, we had all this water coming down into the stream and this mentality of getting away as quickly as possible. So what was the first thing that engineers and hydrologists thought of? Well, let's just keep moving it. Let's keep it going. So if you look at, at um, old school uh, stream and river management and the Mississippi is classic of this because if you go to St. Louis, or if you've seen any movie in LA, all you see are concrete lined straight as an arrow channels of what used to be a meandering stream. It's just been concrete and channelized in a straight line. That will get the water away as quickly as possible. And similarly, when we were thinking about, okay, our stream bank is, is eroding, what do we do about it? Well, let's chuck some big old rock in there because rock is really resistant to stream bank erosion. But again, you're not doing anything to reduce the, the inherent issue of too much water there in the first place. And that's really where GI started to take off because traditional stormwater management was just about hardening things, about protecting things against flooding and getting water away from structures. Now GI, you're not just, you're not just adapting the system to deal with those you know, excessive amounts of water issues, you're also, let, you're also preserving some of that capability of the landscape to actually absorb and deal with the energy involved with all that surface water. So instead of a hard a, uh, concrete line channel, just basically reflecting all of that energy in that stream downstream, a properly restored um, stream bank that's using the principles of GI it's, it's absorbing some of that energy that's hitting that, that, that softer, more natural stream bank that's been graded at, you know, I think roughly 30 to 25% is, is the target slope. 
And you're also reestablishing a bit of that blood plane. So not only are you shoving, not only are you absorbing some of the, the physical energy in the water, but you're capturing a little bit of the sediment and all the pollutants that are in it and getting a little bit of it to settle out along that stream bank as well. So it's, it's really about a much more holistic management approach versus the really traditionally simplistic version of just get the water wet, just move it, just move it, just move it. And that, that's really why GI has become so popular. Yeah, very, very thorough explanation. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you talk about these municipal stormwater systems. Uh, that sounds pretty, um, that sounds pretty uh, like a, a large amount of infrastructure. So I imagine that probably favors overly urban in, uh, environments. And, you know, is there something to the fact that, you know, maybe our rural uh, municipalities uh, you know, maybe don't have these systems. And so, you know, we might fall victims to some of these stormwater problems. And so green infrastructure in a way is a more affordable approach. Um, you know, it's kind of like an easy access uh, type of stormwater. Um, you know, can you, can you speak to, you know, kind of the divide between the municipal and rural stormwater problems? Sure. So, so uh, a large urban setting obviously has a much higher percentage of an impervious surface and a higher density of, uh, of buildup uh, and people for that matter. So like you said, it does, it does make complicated infrastructure more um, economically viable. But if you think in, in a rural setting, what do you have in large amounts are roads and the associated infrastructure of road ditches. Um, so they're essentially they're non-buried pipes in a way, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that people historically approached um, road ditch management. So for example, let me go back if I can. Um, uh, where's my photo here? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we go. So I don't know if you can see it right here. Um, this is right outside the town hall. And you can see this road yep. ditch is just a concrete line. Um, again, you're just moving that water off the landscape as quickly as possible. Um, and if you go around around the town, it, not, not often, but occasionally you'll see some people that have, um, you know, an effort to get water or rain from the foundation of their home. They buried a pipe in their yard um, that's connected to their gutters and it just outlets directly into a road ditch. So again, you're, you're, you're funneling what water that should be dispersed over a large area into a small area, into these interconnected networks for transporting water. And then, you know, as you go down a road ditch network, you're just accumulating more and more water faster and faster and faster. And that's exactly why you get things um, such as like the culvert on 14 at Turk Road that just keeps washing out because it's just, it's, it just it can't handle the, the way that we're, that we're managing that, that water. What, it's just receiving too much water into the drainage system for what it's designed. Um, and that, that's the sort of, of stormwater consequences and management challenges in, in more rural areas. Um, and it, it becomes much more challenging also because it's, it's harder to see, right? Because you do see these, these large open landscapes um, and you don't see the concrete jungle. So it's not as, as um, per pervasive and in your face. But these, anytime you, you alter this, the natural condition of a landscape, you're, you're altering that inherent balance. And in the case of, of um, hydrology and runoff, we've, the main thing we've done uh, around here is, is eliminate a lot of the, the wetlands that, that provided a bit of a sponge, natural sponge on the landscape. And all that water has been pushed into these ditch networks. Um, so, so those are the sort of, of, uh, of things you see in a more rural setting. But the solutions are the same. It's still about, mm -hmm. you know, spread. It's, it's all, it comes back to those three words, right? slow it, spread it, sink it. The strategy is still the same. It's just your, your, um, your system may not be exactly the same. So you, you wouldn't necessarily put a, 
you know, a planter box because on a, on a, if you have three acres of land, you have plenty of space to put a rain garden. It's a little cheaper and a little more effective and can handle a little more um, volume. So it's, it's about adapting GI to the, to the setting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one thing that I've uh, kind of embarked on is, is a town project to, you know, listen to folks about stormwater flows as well as walk ditches um, uh, and, you know, trying to catalog the information. And basically what I've come up with is it's a complex tapestry of stormwater. Uh, you have, you know, people who've and, and the town over time and, and different buildings who have put pipes across roads and through ditches. And it's a very complicated thing. So, you know, I kind of wanted to use this opportunity to, you know, ask you a little bit how, uh, you know, first of all, you know, for those who, you know, might not know about the 9E plan, just, you know, kind of give a little snippet there about the 9E plan and how that's going to address stormwater. You, you said it at the end there about the projects, but um, you know, just in general, you know, how, how just talk a little bit about how it's, it's going to be addressed from the 9E plan perspective. Yeah, so, so the 9E is a major, major component of the 9E um, and what makes it different from traditional watershed management plans is the use of, of uh, qualitative models. So, in, in 9 e we're using a model called SWAT, which stands for Soil Water Assessment Tool. What it does is it creates a link between the information that we're collecting and seeing in the streams um, and the information that we have about the landscape. And it, it, it makes inferences and informs how the actions that we that we are doing, have done, and can do on the landscape will influence and have influence um, the conditions in our surface waters. Um, so, for example, it's it incorporates things like soil, um, land use, um, rainfall patterns, um, crop rotation. Since we have a lot of ag, that's a big one. Um, uh, in management structures such as you know, uh, some municipalities have have permits that require um, stormwater uh, management structures as part of any development. Um, so it incorporates all these landscapes conditions and um, allows us to allows us to add. Um, our own project ideas for the things that we want to implement on the landscape and see what impact um, those projects will yield on water quality. So for example, if we say we want to, I don't know, what's a good example? Let's say we want to capture 15% of runoff on the, on in the urban landscape of Geneva, the city of Geneva, using GI, what what benefit will say the implementation of biosource to do that yield in terms of water quality, both quantitatively and qualitatively? Because the 90 is not just about um, control and runoff volume; it's also principally about nutrient management. Um, so both of those things are, are tied up in the 90. Um, so that's really where the the 90 comes in. Is it is it's it's really a management tool that we're developing to help us inform our strategy on the type of types of projects and where we put them on the landscape to get the results that we're looking for. Yeah, that's really exciting, and you know, excited to see that become unveiled. Uh, I believe you mentioned you know starting you know, hopefully sometime next year, we'll start seeing some, uh, some, some aspects of the plan coming in. Um, and, and one thing that I've always been so inspired, uh, you know, by you and, 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 you know, the other groups that are working on the watershed is, is the use of citizen science, um, you know, to, uh, make some of these leaps in, in data collection. Uh, so, you know, as, you know, before we spoke, you, you mentioned, uh, a citizen science project. Um, 
that that you have going on um, possibly. Uh, so do you, do you have a second to mention uh, that? Yeah, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself and uh, and talk about a citizen pro citizen science project we're developing. But I will say um, that the the information that that's been incorporated into the ninety um, has only been possible due to um, due to the citizen science uh, efforts so far. So we have we gathered. Oh man, I don't even know off the top of my head, but it's well over a thousand unique data points um, collected over almost a decade plus. Um, and on top of what we collected this year that we haven't had a chance to, to finalize yet. Um, so it's, it's really been the, the help of um, something like Pure Water volunteers, um, Hobart William Smith students, um, Cuca College, Cuca Lake Association, um, some of the soil and water districts and water resource councils have collected data over the years. Um, yeah, the, I, I think, I think people underestimate the, the value and, um, importance of, of monitoring data. Um, a lot of people, you know, like to ask, what are you doing about the problem? And what they're getting at is, what what are you putting out there on the landscape to address the solution? But it can be, and while it's certainly tempted to focus on that side of it, um, it's also worth remembering that you can have the most elaborate and well-designed and well-thought-out project out there, but if it's in a place that isn't contributing to much of the problem to start with, all you've done is waste a lot of time and effort. Um, so the, the the citizen science monitoring efforts, both past, present, and hopefully in the future, um, really help us guide, make proper management decisions in terms of how how can we be most effective with the dollars that we have and the capacity that we have to get projects on the ground where they need to be. Um, so it, it's really it's really a, a, a comprehensive approach. You know, you need to have the execution of projects on the ground, you need to have the data inform it, and you need to have um, the buy-in from people to around the community to help implement it. Um, yeah. Appreciate you going into that. And, you know, this is really hopeful. Um, I mean, I was, lucky enough to be involved in the conversations, um, you know, before you were uh, hired as Seneca Lake steward. And, you know, now that, you know, you've been, been the steward for, I think over a year maybe. Um, and it's, and it's really been night and day. Um, you know, it's great to hear about all the different projects you have going on and, um, you know, the ones you have in the coming up in the future. And it, it just makes me, you know, very hopeful for, for the future of Seneca Lake. So, um, you know, we're, we're coming up on the end here. So I just want to use this opportunity to, again to thank uh, Ian Smith for uh, sharing his expertise um, and his uh, thorough PowerPoint with us. Um, and uh, really appreciate it, Ian. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Jacob. All right, everyone, uh, have a nice day. And this uh, webinar uh, will be posted on the Town of Geneva website um, as a part of the Lake Friendly Living Series. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye.